Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Eddie Tunstall. Eddie is the CTO of Motive Space Systems. Uh, Eddie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Spencer. I'm glad to be here. Glad to have Thanks you on. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Oh, quite. So I don't meet a whole lot of people who work on space robots. So I guess a good place to start seems to be like, how'd you get into that field? Wow. Space robots. You really haven't met a lot of people who, who don't work on space robots? I know a few people, <laughs> but I mean, it's one of those exotic industries, kidding. I feel like. No, it, it certainly is a, a small world within that, that particular domain. Uh, you know, I got into it, uh, incidentally, over 30 years ago. Um, you know, I uh, came out of uh, university looking to get into robotics way back then. And um, I was really trying to see if I could land a job at a place that was really, in my point, from my point of view, doing the cutting edge uh, stuff at the time. Uh, incidentally, this was at a time when robots were fairly pervasive in factories, doing uh, on aut automobile assembly lines and things like that. And that was kind of the job, if you will, or something similar that one who studied robotics coming out of the university might actually end up doing. Um, awesome. I thought was I was looking a little bit for something more challenging. And um, from what I could tell going on out there in the world, uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory was doing some pretty cool stuff. Cool or at least they were trying to at the time. Uh, they had not really flown robotic missions uh, prior to that uh, of the type that we're currently used to today. So this would have um, been the early 90s, just for reference. Yes, this was, uh, this was yes, uh, late 80s, in fact. Oh, cool. Late Incredible. 80s, yeah. Yeah, I, I came out of with my master's degree in 1989. So I right about that time. have been alive for one year. Is that right? <laughs> 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 yeah, so I got, I've been at it for a long time. But yeah, I was looking around at that time and um, I became aware that JPO had some ambitions uh, to actually put together robotic systems and somehow get them to Mars and do interesting things. Um, I had also known that JPO was working at that time on uh, what we now refer to as uh, satellite servicing on orbit. Um, they were working on back then with some, uh, some Puma robotic arms in a test bed, uh, they had some mock-ups of spinning satellites and such. And uh, the whole idea was trying to get those robotic arms to stop those satellites from spinning and do some servicing on them. Well, cool. So I knew that JPO was doing this cool work. Uh, so I basically sort of targeted my, uh, my job search, if you will, for potentially be, being so fortunate as to uh, perhaps get an interview, first of all, and then <laughs> secondly, to get hired. Nice. Uh, I, I also fashioned my, my master's thesis at the time on something that uh, I felt could be attractive um, to organizations like that. Um, and turns out it did. It was attractive. Um, I did get a, uh, it's interesting, the, I, I came out of Howard University at the time. And um, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory was often on the recruitment list in our Office of Academic Affairs and such. But that year, or the year prior, two years prior, they were not. How did the that year change? I was coming out? Yeah, some, I don't know what the deal was or okay, what happened, but for some reason they were not on the list. Um, but the year that I was coming out, they were back on the list. So I had an opportunity on campus uh, to interview with some folks from there. And long story short, that went well. I ended up with a nice uh, job interview, flown out to Pasadena and all that. And what do you know, uh, the folks who were interviewing me uh, were interested in what I was doing, in particular, for my thesis. So it was more nice. relevant than I had even imagined. Uh, and so that worked out well. I ended up getting a job offer and started a career at JPL. So that's how I got in. That's awesome. To face robotics. I got a couple of questions just off of that, if you don't mind me asking. Yeah, sure. And a cool story, Shoot. by the way. But Shoot away. One is, um, so I had another guest on the podcast who talked about working in Grumman for Grumman on the precursor to Robonaut, which he talks is like, I can't remember the name it was called, but it was something for catching out of control satellites, which sounds very similar. I almost yeah, wonder if it yeah, would have been the likely. same project. Uh, and it then, might have been the same, or might have been a, a number of other was going on inside. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I could. It was maybe the in flight servicing. I'm going to get it wrong. No, uh, no, that, that sounds like it had to be fairly close. Um, back then, there were other organizations and universities working on things, including the University of Maryland, for example. Cool. And they were working on a project called Ranger. 
Uh, Ranger was a, uh, an on-orbit satellite um, prototype that had a couple of robotic arms. And there were variations of those at uh, uh, at least pieces of them at JPL. JPL was involved in that and some other universities. I think even to this day, the University of Maryland at College Park, a uh, laboratory run by Dave Aiken Space Systems Lab, I think they still have in their underwater uh, facility uh, a mock-up or a version of the Ranger Oh, cool. uh, robotic system. So this yeah. would have been a satellite with KUKA arms on it that catches other satellites and works on them? Effectively. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Just think of your garden variety, for lack of a better description, satellite with uh, equipped with a couple of robotic arms and uh, manipulation capability at the end of vectors. That sounds um, yeah. really, really fun to work on. Uh, indeed. It's interesting, though. You know, back then it was kind of a, a big topic at the time, and it's in the U.S. at least, it kind of went away over the years. And uh, NASA, for example, at least in terms of uh, robotics uh, exploration, um, we got more into the rovers at that time. Uh, it wasn't shortly after I, you know, I got hired at GPL when uh, we got, I ended up working more on rover projects. Um, but in Europe and uh, some of these, some other countries, including Canada, there was still an emphasis on this on-orbit servicing over the years. Uh, and uh, the U.S. is really now in the past decade or two really coming back around to this. Why do you think it was that the U.S. changed their uh, focus from on-orbit servicing to rovers? I think that at the time it maybe became ahead of its time in terms of the, uh, the business case for it. Um, you know, there weren't a lot of uh, folks or companies that actually had a lot of assets up there to begin with. And um, for those that did, um, I guess it wasn't enough of an, of an economy base to, to support that kind of thing. That so it sense. would have been, yeah, I'm yeah. And it, no, it's okay. And, and at the same time, uh, you know, the interest in Mars and in, in particular the technology maturation uh, was at a point where that was going to happen relatively soon. And so that was a big reason for the shift, at least particularly at JPL and uh, some, of the, some of the other NASA centers. That makes a lot of sense. You've got a finite number of roboticists and a finite number of just engineers in general, and you can only really attack so many research problems. And Indeed. not that many people would rather just launch a new satellite than service an existing one, then, as you put it, the business case just wasn't there to support that. Right, exactly. And I will say that to some degree, the technology wasn't quite there yet either. We were still really working on these things and trying to get to a point where they could be ready for that. What is what's changed in terms of the technology? Like what I imagine just edge compute has been getting better would be one thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. that that's one of the things. Uh, computing period, as you know, has really accelerated and enabled a lot of things. I would also say the robotics technology as well. Uh, robotics as a science has matured. So just the algorithms um, or the manipulators? Algorithms, both? Okay. control techniques, um, all again underpinned by the advance in computing. Yeah, makes right? sense. <laughs> yeah, and these all connected. And so uh, all of that has um, really occurred since and enabled a number of things, including things like, uh, like, like cameras. You know, camera technology has even um, gotten to a point where uh, we can do a whole lot more with them with a whole lot less resources. You know, um, but it's all intertwined. The computation associated with uh, dealing with uh, processing camera data uh, is benefited by the acceleration in computing, spe computing speed and memory capacity, all these things. So in some ways, the rover was just a lower hanging target to be able to do with the tech you needed to make it work correctly. Because when you're chasing a satellite that's spinning and tumbling, it's just very complicated to do with the tech we had in the late 80s, early 90s. I'm, yeah, so yeah. I think that's that's part of it, but okay. I think a relative yeah. small part, because I really think the the larger part was really the main shift in focus uh, within NASA at the time, away from the sort of on-orbit servicing type of uh, activity to the more exploratory uh, focus on Mars in particular. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, what was your master's thesis about, since you referenced it a few times, uh, talking about... Oh, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, no, thanks for asking. Yeah, sure. um, let's see if I remember. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my master's thesis was uh, focused on symbolic uh, computation uh, in order to automatically generate the uh, models for, for robot manipulators, including uh, kinematic and dynamic models, as well as error models uh, for error compensation algorithms. And so think, think about this. Think about uh, 
And in fact, this was part of the motivation for it too back then. Um, in one's first introduction to robotics course at the undergraduate level, I guess this is probably still the case, it's largely, uh, you know, uh, covering kinematics. Yeah, that was a big part um, of it when I did right? it. Right. It's indeed. And we learned how to uh, use various uh, representations like the identified Hardenberg representation, yep. uh, the matrices that, that uh, they, they, they form, and how to do forward and inverse kinematics and these things. True. And so I don't know if today, if students are still doing all that yeah, by that's hand pretty on paper. Congruent to how I did it, at least when I was uh, an undergrad going through. I mean, yeah. that was like 10, 12 years ago, but. Okay, and so so yes, it's kind of a, a, a rough, but a, a, a good introduction to the, the underlying mathematics, right? Um, well, that process, as you might recall, was quite tedious, and one could make some interesting errors along the way yep. uh, in dealing with all of that. <laughs> Uh, and so I had taken um, hold to a program, a symbolic computation uh, application program called Maxima. Have you ever heard of Maxima? Not yet, but I'm interested. Okay, so Maxima, I, I think it might still be around. This is quite old now. Uh, came out of MIT originally. It's, uh, cool. It was an AI Lisp-based uh, symbolic computation uh, tool. Um, comparable tools are things like Mathematica. And, and MathCAD, if you've heard of that. Interesting. So, so basically, I've heard of Mathematica. Yeah. I haven't used it in my uh -huh. memory. MathCAD, I don't know yet. Um, I feel like Wolfram Alpha comes to mind, but I don't know if that's congruent or not. Yeah, any, any, sure. anything that uh, that takes symbols, you know, variables, X, Y, theta, and all these things, uh, and does computations with them like we might do on paper. Or, or, or would be things that are comparable. So would MATLAB be comparable then? MATLAB is comparable, although MATLAB uh, deals mostly primarily with num uh, with numbers. Yep. Right. Um, I think that MATLAB actually may have a capability now to deal with just symbols, no numbers. Okay. I'm gonna, yeah. Don't don't quote me on that. But uh, I haven't used it but, in a few years yeah. myself. <laughs> and, and yeah, actually, I mean, a lot of folks would use things like that in Mathematica. Uh, for doing derivations and such, or things that they didn't want to go through the tedium of doing themselves. Uh, and so what I ended up using that for, Maxima in particular, was um, to automatically do what we had to do on hand, but by hand, on paper. Cool. Effectively uh, give the program that I had developed um, the Denovit Hardenberg parameters for a particular robotic arm, Press a few buttons, click a few buttons, and so forth, and out pops the uh, the forward kinematic solution. Nice, and 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 thetas and everything else. <laughs> That's cool. You know, and uh, similarly, I had worked out a means to uh, compute the inverse kinematic solution as well using that program. Interesting. That was tough. Yeah, I would have. But, thought, but I, would I, think so, I managed cause... to pull it off. Yeah, I mean, it has you know a lot of the underlying uh, mathematical operations that one would do, but it's just doing it with, with, some, with symbols. Yeah. So the way the program was um, sort of set up was it would give you uh, all of the solutions or both of the solutions given that whatever the case might be, be it elbow up or elbow down or something like that. Oh, cool. um, and, you, and you could decide which one to opt for. Um, did you I tried visualize to be so or did clever. you have to kind of figure it all out from symbols and matrices? Uh, from symbols and matrices. There might have been a, num a few numbers in there where if something yeah. was like, you know, 2 theta or 2x, yeah. <laughs> you know, it would carry the numbers through, but it was largely a symbolic uh, program. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And it, it was int of interest, at least that kind of work was of interest uh, to JPL at the time uh, when I interviewed because uh, the error model aspect of it. Um, back then, a lot of the focus of, st of the study of manipulators was... Uh, the fact that um, you can pump three or four out of the same assembly line and their uh, intrinsic parameters, kinematic and so forth, will be slightly different. It makes sense. Therefore, you know, making the you know, A matrices and everything else just a little bit different. We still deal with that today, but companies have a way of uh, sort of giving you, in effect, a c configuration file or a calibration file that uh, compensates for that particular uh, manufactured item. So it's abstracted uh, away from the end user. Effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. yeah. And so, you know, back then uh, we were, that was a big interest in the community uh, because it underlied uh, the accuracy and repeatability of these manipulators. 
Uh, and so that was certainly something that GPO was interested in um, at that time, looking at uh, dealing with things like uh, touching and manipulating uh, satellites and such. Um, nice. So if you had a means to model those uh, errors for a particular manipulator arm, and this program will kind of pump that out for you, here are the error compensation equations, yeah. um, then you could factor that in effectively into your control and algorithm. You would intrinsically calibrate that to the, the satellite, like the entire kinematic chain for the base and all the arms that are mounted to it? Yeah, ultimately you could do that. But my, my, my thesis didn't um, focus on a broader system, just a single manipulator. Got it. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was interesting. Yeah. Nice introduction to the whole, you know, scheme of things. I've always been a pretty empirical, uh, more intuitive guy, and I've not been as good at the math. So whenever I meet somebody that can conceptualize that type of um, that type of work, I'm always really impressed. <laughs> you know, it's... Me too, actually. <laughs> it's all relative, I'll tell you. You know, it's, uh, it's one, one interesting thing about that uh, that thesis was that my advisor at the time at Howard University, he, he found utility in it in that he could use it to grade the actual hand derivations that students would do when they come through that course. Wait, the, the what now? The... So the same program that I developed for my yeah. thesis, uh, he could use it to grade the hand derived forward and inverse kinematic solutions, et cetera, that other students would come up oh, with. Oh, interesting. So, okay, so you still had to enter the the um, derivation into the program, but once you entered in all the symbols, you could actually look and see if it was correct? Well, for once you entered into the symbols, and the symbols in this case are just the Denevid Hartenberg's parameters yeah. for a particular manipulator, what comes out the other side, if you're just looking for the forward kinematics, are those equations. That's awesome. And so he could look at that output against what a student actually derived on paper and compare. That's incredible. So yeah, it probably saved yeah. a hell of a lot of work to the TAs and the professor and grading all that Absolutely. Work. So he was delighted about it in that regard, of course. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I didn't do quite the same thing, but when I was mm -hmm. in elementary school, I remember I was so proud of myself because I wrote a program that could do basic geometry and, and do my mm -hmm. homework for me. Oh, okay. And my teacher allowed me to use it to effectively cheat on my own homework with my program I wrote. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that was a worthy exercise, but whether yeah. you knew it at, at that time or not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, they let me get away with it for whatever reason. But right, right. Uh, that's that's really cool, though. I mean, that's that's way cooler than anything I did in grad school. I, I feel like my my master's thesis was on. Um, robots uh, with projectors on the end showing assembly workers kind of uh, prompts on where to put bolts and pieces. I see, were, okay. Um, okay. But not as practical, I think, as yours. Like, I don't think uh, my professor ended up using it in their work or NASA yeah, or JPL got interested. <laughs> so that's, it's that's a, it awesome. was a different time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also just Things a way a more lot. impressive project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, things are a lot more applied, you know, these days. You know, we've got... Thankfully, you know, a lot of the uh, underlying uh, theoretical basis and all of that kind of worked out for a lot of things. And so now a lot of the brain power and innovation really comes with, uh, well, what do you do with it now? You know, how many cool things can you do? That's that's a good you know? point. I, I actually was yeah. visiting um, the Masters in Robotic Systems Development uh, program recently at John Dolan's program. And mm -hmm. I remember... Yeah, at CMU. That's that's where I went. And so uh, All right. before John awesome. took over, and um, I, I was looking at the demos recently, and they were really impressive. I mean, it was integration work, like what you're describing. Yeah. But yeah. some of the things the students were able to do, and and are still doing, and improving on their demos. I mean, the program's really evolved, and I'm really impressed just watching you know the students plug in. Um, like for instance, when I when I watch the demos, one of the things they were able to do is I don't know if it was John or like a student, but somebody was throwing like amazon.com boxes in front of this robot that was mm -hmm. navigating the hallways and it was able to circumnavigate the boxes and then okay. it went into a room and then it was a hello robot, uh, which is kind of an under actuated system. Uh -huh. And um, it, it was able to, there were a bunch of objects on a table and the students were like, okay, pick one to the professors and they did. And okay, the robot nice. successfully yep. grasped it. And apparently okay. it was it was not that probable of an outcome, but it worked out when I saw it. So I was impressed. I gotcha. <laughs> so. It's interesting how 
uh, the layperson watching a demo like that um, easily doesn't appreciate all that goes into it oh, and for how sure. all the different things that could go wrong. Um, so whenever so you many. see it, even, yeah, no, really, even, even as roboticists, when we see these things work well, it's, it's you know, it puts a smile on our faces as well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, it's a miracle. There's so many things that could go wrong to screw that up. Yeah. I mean, if, if something's not calibrated correctly or a wire's a little bit loose or, you know, mm -hmm. a, a sign is reversed or yeah. a camera yeah. has a little bit of dust on the lens or... You know, it just right. something doesn't go exactly right in any number of ways. I mean, it could, it just isn't going to work, you know, and so. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's yeah, right. That's was, the nature, nature of the business, it seems. For sure. <laughs> and it's getting better, I feel like. Um, like the algorithms are getting better and more redundant and the technology is yeah. getting better and the hardware is getting better. But I don't know. I mean, even, you know, coming up, you know, quite a bit later than you did, I, I, it still is precarious field and. It is. Yeah. It is. I often say to people that I, at least, still consider it a research field. Yeah, I think that's. You know? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things that's just saying that are working well and so on. Um, a lot of times I give talks, I might talk about, you know, uh, what I consider to be sort of the um, the realm of, uh, of innovation these days for robotics, where that's underpinned uh, in, in sort of a pyramid sense by these things we had been working on all these, over the decades, the manipulation, the navigation, the, uh, the simulation, you know, all these things that are now working fairly well. Um, but I always point out that even at those lower layers, there's still work to be done. Yeah, for you know, sure. To make these things more and more robust. Uh, but you're right, it's precarious indeed. Lower layers is a good word for it too. I mean, it's almost like yeah. the stones on which your foundation's built. And if any of that's yeah. not built correctly, the whole thing comes tumbling down. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly. a great way to look at it. Yeah, yeah, it, it helps me at least. Uh, I keep my 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 sort of own mental context about the field. You know. Yeah. Like these days, there's a lot of a uh, lot going on, of course, in AI and, and machine learning, of course, right? Yeah, and, and that um, stuff goes so far over my head. So it'd be interesting. To get yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Uh, but that's true for many of us, right? <laughs> it's sort of like it's, it's gotten to the point where it's now just kind of a thing. Well, it is a thing. It's a phenomenon. You know, people will refer to AI. Uh, some people will refer to an AI, <laughs> right, uh, as, as a thing. Um, and it's um, is a lot under that, a lot to unpack that is not obvious to most folks. But yeah. um, things are like just like in various aspects of robotics things are working well these days and getting much more much much better than they had been in the past and at least in terms of uh sort of accuracy the performance level repeatability um yeah uh, exactly yeah. you know and so of course the challenge as you might be aware is uh the prevailing methods and techniques for doing a good job at that these days are really very heavily machine learning and deep learning based yeah yeah um, and it seems to be is that just from a runtime efficiency perspective that people tend to go to that a lot of the time? It seems. Yeah. yeah. Oh, in some cases, um, a lot of times it's also due to. I know that in the past when we used to really focus a lot, a lot on uh, sort of the general area of intelligent control systems, where what we were trying effectively. Control systems refer to exactly. Good, Sorry, I shouldn't have cut good you. Good question. No, nice. no problem. Great question because um, the term is not used as much these days. Um, but basically, what it was was trying to apply. Uh, AI and what we refer to as soft computing uh, sort of technologies, including machine learning, uh, to traditional control systems. So that's like an auto-tuning PID control, for instance? Um, that's even more low level okay. than, than what I'm referring to. But, but, but it's along those lines. So, so to think about the earlier um, research in neural networks as one example. Or you might even heard of a, a term or an area called fuzzy logic. I've heard of that. Yeah, I remember. Okay, so so the, the early two thousands that was that was you hear about that a lot. Yeah, and and also think you know genetic algorithms, evolutionary algorithms, um, and then the more traditional AI when it comes to the underlying algorithms that are are responsible for our path planning capabilities. You know, certain search te techniques, depth first, breadth first, all yep. these things that you find in the early AI textbooks. Um, I didn't it realize was a, that depth first and breadth first search were examples of AI. That's I would think of that as graph theory, but is that 
it was the, these were the things that showed up in the early AI textbooks. Cool. Okay. They, they were part of part of because they enabled effectively to enabled you to search graphs, and uh, many of the problems back then were um, sort of set up in a graph sense, right? Um, even things like fault trees and stuff like that. Wow. You know, yeah. And so it was, these were various algorithms and te techniques that were being uh, maturing in that time frame. And um, in the control system realm, where you know you start to deal with more and more complex systems that you need to control, it wasn't always easy uh, or easy enough to model them mathematically, at least accurately. And so there was a, an, an effort along that time to look at these other techniques, um, rule-based techniques, expert systems, all these things that you can maybe combine with control systems in order to make them smart yeah. <laughs> or at least smarter at what they're doing or smarter at doing what you could so do in a, in a mathematical model. It's kind of a way of empirically tuning out error on, on a less than perfect model that you're using to control a system. Um, that was certainly one of the pervasive applications of the technology. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. In fact, I recall that, uh, uh, you know, sort of even parameter selection for things like go back to the auto tuning example, PID, for example, in order to select those gains, um, it's kind of a black art to some degree. Yeah, for right? sure. And um, so even that was um, those types of problems were attacked at, into some by some uh, some researchers with things like fuzzy logic, right? Using um, trying to encode an expert's knowledge about how they tune those uh, gains and then be able to make it automatic there, there, but through the encoding and they basically end up doing auto tuning of PID gains using the fuzzy logic algorithm. So I, I think what I'm getting is that it's it's sort of a rough, rough approximation of what a person would do without really knowing why you're reaching that that eventuality. But I guess because I'm, I'm more of like a hardware specialist and I, I just don't really understand AI as well. Can you maybe explain to me as a layperson um, just what like the fuzzy logic methodology looks like? And I apologize if I'm kind of slow here or I don't pick up right away. Oh, no, it's yeah. fine. It's kind fine. I'm curious to yeah, get my sure. head around I... it. And you seem like you know a lot about it. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, that was my uh, my PhD thesis was heavily involved in that oh, cool. area. Um, so, yeah, basically, uh, let me start with one of the canonical examples that folks tend to use when they use uh, when they talk about fuzzy logic or something like that. Um, so when you refer to, say, a colleague or a friend uh, as being tall, OK, um, you are normally not really precisely thinking about an exact height. As the beginning of tall, like maybe six foot, six foot, uh, six, six foot, foot one, six foot two. Yeah, something like that. The, the, so, so the fact that you, in fact, you're saying six foot one, six foot two, it's a fuzzy concept. Yeah, because I right? didn't give one number; I gave two different ones, and I don't really have a hard cutoff for the beginning of call. Okay, I, I can follow that. That's right, and 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 so a range of, of numbers in this case probably apply to to what you would refer to as tall. And tall for me might not be tall for somebody else who's taller than me. Exactly, exactly. So if you think about that concept just by itself, and you think about the um, uh, say five people. Who all more or less agree on what tall is, <laughs> but they all have a different. You know, they might give you different ranges of numbers, but they all agree to some extent. That range of numbers could be represented uh, by a fuzzy set. Okay. Similar to a set that we've learned about in logic uh, courses and study, um, but this is fuzzy logic, and the big, the, the main difference underlying that is the set itself. A set can be not, or even a, a decision is not necessarily zero or one, yes or no, but can be sort of in the maybe regime. Okay, so it's like a continuum of the degree of certainty that that's with, so six point, six foot one inch is like 0.8 tall out of one, maybe is how you would look at that. Like it's 80% likely to be considered tall. So, something tells me you study fuzzy logic in your dreams. Uh, you're just a good teacher, <laughs> I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I say that because you're, you're exactly right. I mean, we, we can define a, a so-called fuzzy set such that that becomes the, um, the, the computation. Yeah. So, yeah somebody is 0.8 uh, you know, tall or what have you. 
Okay, that so makes a lot of sense. So these concepts and so on, you can you can uh, spread these uh, fuzzy sets across what we call, refer to as a universal discourse, basically like an x-axis of uh, valid of uh, uh, value range range. Okay, and um, and you can define these concepts: um, short, tall, you know, medium, and all that. Yeah. But not only that, you can compute with these concepts. Uh, you can create what are effectively if-then rules. Uh, okay. If uh, if 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 Joe is tall, where tall is quote unquote a fuzzy a set. Interesting. Uh, then something. And okay. the, on the then side, those could also be represented by fuzzy sets so that, uh, you know, you don't make precise. Oh, interesting. Uh, so like 80% of six foot one people are considered tall and 70% of tall people are considered big or like something. I don't know. I'm just kind of it, along those speculating. Lines. Okay. The, the, the main idea, though, is that it enables you to encode uh, reasoning and inference in a more similar way, it seems at least intuitively, to the way we do it as humans. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that's that's effectively what it is. And we were able to use that sort of thing. Like, for example, I'll give you an example from my uh, PhD work, um, an, an obstacle avoidance algorithm, right? Um, I might be saying, okay, I want to follow a wall while also about avoiding obstacles. Um, well, I've got some sensors that measure range, uh, and I can set up a set of uh, fuzzy uh, sets such that I can say an object is close, near, far, all these different concepts. And you're probably using sonar in those days, which means I was, in fact. it's not That's the cleanest right. sensor reading, so it's probably good to apply an inference to your results. Exactly, exactly. And I, and I exploited that uh, coincidence, if you will. Nice. Um, as, as, as part, part motivation for why I applied fuzzy logic to the problem. Um, and so, yeah, so you could think about those concepts and then you could make up rules that say, okay, um, if the robot is close to the wall, right? Not if it's, um, you know, 0.3, you know, meters away, if yeah. it's close, um, then, uh, the motor control command is slow down. It makes sense. And you could continue with all your different rules that make up how you would want you want this thing to drive, and you encode these concepts on the input using fuzzy sets, encode them on the output using fuzzy sets, and then there's mathematics, inference, and so forth that actually help you compute a real answer in the end. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, something you can send to the motors. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's effectively what it's like. Um, and I, I applied that to uh, uh, indoor robot navigation problems. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. And the fact that you can have compound rules is really interesting, too, yeah. where you have an inference based upon an inference. And so that's right. I would think your error probably stacks up as you add layers and layers and layers within fuzzy logic. Are those probabilities constant, or can those get adjusted with, like, self-tuning? Uh, they can. Okay, that's that's really In fact, that was uh, yeah, very similar to the the PID auto tuning. Um, back then, a lot of uh, effort was put into using neural networks or using genetic algorithms to tune fuzzy sets. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's all parameter uh, optimization. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because yeah. you're only going to get so good just kind of taking a best guess, but if you brute force it by just allowing it to tune itself over a large period of time, you mm -hmm. might be able to get a better result, you know, just given, you know, a large enough data set. That was in fact the focus of a lot of research papers back then. Wow. Okay. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Show, showing that, um, for example, a fuzzy logic control solution could outperform an optimal control solution on a given problem. Nice. Okay. What, what like is considered that. optimal, though, by that definition? Because I feel optimal like it's not really in the optimal. Of, okay, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Optimal in the sense of optimal control theory. Oh, okay. I don't know about that yet. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So basically, yeah, just uh, model-based, right? You okay. have a model that describes your system, and you close the feedback control loop around that that model, but you, uh, you have certain constraints uh, that, that apply as well that define what's optimal. And so your control system becomes designed in such a way that uh, it satisfies those those control constraints and therefore is pre 
presumed to be optimal in that context. Based on how you've defined the system, but not necessarily yeah. based on how the real world behaves um, with the actual example? Um, well, I yes, but ideally both. Okay. So, for example, optimal control theory is a is is fairly common in say like spacecraft control. Interesting. Right, and so yeah, you want it to be uh, pretty well aligned with the real world in that context. That makes so a lot optimal of sense. in the real world as well as optimal mathematically. <laughs> so it's it's based on actual readings in a lab when you've calibrated um, that system, not just based on what it's supposed to be. And what you had at the beginning with an open loop, and then you machine, and you build up, you know, uh, error. Um, it's it's more tuned based on the finished product, or I'm maybe well, I'm off the mark here. Uh, yes, is the answer, but also during runtime, right? Because this is all all feedback control, right? So whenever the system that, that is uh, so controlled is actually running, you've got uh, feedbacks uh, from from sensory, uh, you know, channels that actually feed in into the algorithm. And the optimality, in terms of the what, what computes the control every cycle, yeah. is still happening. So how do you outperform that? That sounds like that's a good question. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. yeah. So I, I don't I don't know that uh, you know folks would um, would see that as intuitive or, or even possible back then. But this was all the rage in terms of um, when you were able to show such a result. Um, and the, the the way you can say sort of rationalize it is that in optimal control theory and really any model based con uh, control theory, uh, the model is the key, right? And if the model is not entirely right, okay, yeah, that, but that, yeah, yeah, yeah you've optimized around it. That, yeah. yeah, so 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 things like those techniques they would kind of compensate for things you could not model. Okay, makes a lot of sense now. Yeah. And that's been my experience as well, is that models are always imperfect. I mean, you can never get it yeah. to be entirely accurate to the way the real world is. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, it's, uh, we, we're still doing the same things with um, now AI and machine learning. Um, but uh, we, we've gotten a lot more sophisticated, I would say. Nice. And I do have some friends that work in that field. And I, I've, like I said, I've been sort of looking at what the new students have been doing as well. And I'm always impressed with, you know, just some of the uh, the recent work. The stuff people are willing to show me in demos, I should say, is impressive. To me. Right. I'm sure there's a lot of failures I don't see. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> That's cool. And yeah. Not, not to change the subject too much, but you mentioned lay people. And um, uh -huh. I was actually, I, I was getting lunch with a friend earlier today, and um, she's not a roboticist. And she was asking me um, some questions that were kind of interesting and I hadn't really thought about in a while. One of them, these, and the, again, this is gonna sound weird to, to a person with your training and it sounded weird to me, but I'm kind of curious how you would answer these. So she asked me like, can robots be sentient with AI, which to my thought is probably not these days, but maybe eventually at some point, but I don't really know. I was just kind of guessing because yeah. I'm not an AI expert. And then the other one is like, are nanobots a real thing? So I think she had read a lot of science fiction. Um, right, right. And I, I was trying to sort of speculate, but I mean, I don't really know the answers to those kind of questions. What do you What do you say yeah. when people come to you with stuff like that? Just like curiosity. Uh, I say, uh, have we met? No, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. No. Uh, so no, I, these things come up every now and then, yeah. as you know. So. Um, and, you know, there are indeed a lot of science fiction movies that really shape the current thinking of the layperson. Um, yeah. And so it's inevitable that the questions will come up. But um, incidentally, I one of the big companies, I want to say it's Google, but don't quote me because I, I don't want to be wrong about that, um, has a researcher who in current Internet news um, is already suggesting that uh, something of their technology or software uh, is or has exhibited some degree of uh, sentient uh, existence. Yeah. So it's, yeah, look, look out there on the on the internet. There's probably some interesting uh, articles about. Yeah, Carl, if you can find um, this in research, you can just put it put it on the on the screen. But if not, you know, it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. And so now, from my own point of view. Uh, I haven't been close enough to any work that I could suggest um, has that conclusion. 
Yeah. Um, whether or not I think it's possible, I don't know. So I, I'm on, on the side of the fence where, uh, you know, I think that I have to always remind myself yeah. that our brains, our wetware, is an entirely different beast than our computers. I agree. Right? Um, this gets almost back to the whole logic and fuzzy logic thing. Yeah. Right? Because the computers are dealing with ones and zeros. Yeah. And we're not. Right? And so I look at the struggle that we have since the, I guess, the 60s more accurately, but um, really the 70s and so on with AI, period and um where we are today we're still not that far along to what you know folks will call refer to as generalized ai and, and so on all the, all the various I terms that are first um and so i think it will still take a long while and maybe some interesting sort of miracle or breakthrough before we get to a point where we can really refer to machines or computers or robots as being sensual yeah i agree with that, you there that's my my view and I could be wrong. There might yeah. be somebody in the lab right now, you know, jumping up and down with a eureka moment. I don't know. <laughs> well, there's a lot of stuff in the universe and in the world I don't know about is kind of what I answered my friend when she asked me that question, you know, and I, I yeah. don't know what somebody's doing in a lab somewhere in the world, you know, because I, I'm not aware of everything that goes on. But to, sure. it hasn't crossed my path yet, put it that way. Right, and right. We can it's be definitely at, not pervasive. Yeah, and, and if it were, we 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 knew we know about it. Really. I think we would. <laughs> you definitely yeah. would. I, I probably would. <laughs> so. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see. But uh, <laughs> but as to the other question about uh, nanobots, I guess was was her question was were they? Were well, they I, real? I think they I think the sci-fi concept that she was like she had seen because I I sort of ran it by her to verify because I, I nanobots kind of a buzzword and I don't really know exactly what it means, yeah. but. I took it to mean a few, like one was just miniaturization of, of a robot, which I mean, like how small does it have to be to be considered a nanobot? And we're right. not really good at making stuff that small. And then the other one is, I think in sci-fi, there's this idea of like self-replicating robots that like just start to take over everything because it just wants to make more of itself. And yeah. so, yeah. Um, and I know engineers who are very, very intelligent, but also sci-fi fans that tell me about this mm -hmm. stuff. And, you know, right. it's, it's interesting because like there is, it sort of fits like a, a logic, but it doesn't fit into current technology. And so, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, to make a machine self replicate is, is difficult because I mean, any machine that can build a machine is incredibly complicated and yeah. things you can make. It's, it's sort of almost paradoxical because you can't, really make something complex enough to make something as complicated as itself. I don't know. If that makes right. Sense. Yeah. No, that, that would make sense. You know, uh, I think, you know, certainly this is one of the reasons I like the field of robotics, because a lot of these things are things that someone has tried or is trying. Yeah. Constantly, um, like every single year, multiple times, different people are trying to get their PhDs and that's right. that or masters or, you know, I mean, if you could do it, you'd think somebody would be taking advantage. Absolutely. I mean, I can probably point to uh, publications in the past that um, would, you know, purport to have a solution to self-replicating -rep robot, for example. Um, I have a colleague uh, who uh, did research uh, on that back in maybe the 90s, I guess it might have been. Um, and in particular, in the context of uh, uh, moon exploration. Oh, interesting. Where the idea was, yeah, have, have send send uh, your your capabilities up there, but also send the capability for uh, robots to effectively configure and uh, build and, and operate in and around a sort of factory, a portion of which would be a portion that could self -re self -re replicate them. Yeah, that would be awesome if we could do it. I mean, you could yeah. accomplish so yeah. much. Yeah. So so there was he he had a study back then. He had some interesting ideas. Um, I know that in his later research, he did have students who would try to put various aspects of that into hardware with some good results. What did they? Um, but I don't know. Say again. How were they able to achieve that? Um, just out of curiosity. Um, yeah, I was about to say I, I don't know that they, you know, have sort of achieved the whole thing. Okay, got it. You know, there was you know certain aspects of it where uh, there were uh, small modules that make up various aspects of the robot, and uh, there were ways to manufacture those. Quickly these days, people might try to do that through, through 3D printing, for example. Yep. Um, and then uh, it became kind of a 
uh, a self reconfiguration problem, you know, with like a robot swarm kind of thing, you know, depending on what you yeah, need to sense. put together of the elemental pieces, you know, you basically do an algorithm that makes that happen and so on. Yeah, that um, makes a lot of sense. But yeah, there's still so missing there are, elements where you can't quite get the whole thing to go. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So there, there are no, no question. There's still problems to be solved in that whole scheme of things. Yeah. Um, but there are. There's also been along the same line uh, a fairly vibrant sub area of robotics. I think still referred to as micro robotics. Um, and this is where some of it uh, has a foot in the uh, the medical domain. Uh, some is just very exploratory. Um, but there have been prototypes of small devices that in order to watch them operate, you'd have to watch them under a microscope. Oh, cool. Yeah. And these are being geared towards things like being able to um, let them loose, for example, or something like that, loose in your bloodstream to deliver medicines and yep. so forth to the right places and all of that. Makes sense. Um, also, back in the, I guess, 80s, 90s area era, there was a uh, you know, the field, still a, a broad field today, called MEMS, Microelectromechanical Systems. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, these were ways to deal, to take uh, the electronics uh, and highly integrated circuit technology that we use with the silicon and other materials um, to do uh, integrated circuit chips and processes and all that, but to shape them into things like gears and, and shafts and all of that, Nice. At that microscopic level, and effectively make a micro machine. I feel like whenever I see MEMS depicted, it always looks like a two-dimensional um, construction. Is that mm -hmm. the case, or is that just how it's generally visualized in, in your knowledge? Maybe, maybe how it's generally visualized. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because there certainly is a. Uh, they don't tend to build things on those substrates uh, with much height, but there is a third yeah. dimension in many cases. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So these things are out there. Folks have been working at it for a while. I, I can't say that I can point to a company, for example, that can sell you some nano nanobots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the technology that probably will enable a nanobot, um, some folks are working on those things. And it's advancing. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing what people are accomplishing. And, and I, I just ask you because you seem to have your finger on a pulse for – a few things I don't just, you know, mm -hmm. exposed to different parts of industry. Right. And, uh, you know, I, when she asked me, I'm just like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't think so. Right. No, I hear you. Yeah. It's definitely know. not obvious, you know. Yeah. So. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So um, one of the things that impressed me about uh, Motive's website, and I, I brought this up a few times to you, were mm -hmm. the specifications on the robotic arm you developed uh, for a, a Mars rover recently. Is that correct? So it was um, the one that we yeah, we talked about before was for is for a upcoming lunar lander. Apologies. Okay. Not a problem. Not a yeah, problem. But we, they, we did we did deliver a robotic arm for the Mars Perseverance rover. Though. That was the one I might have been thinking of, but okay, okay. Well, maybe not though, because I, I mentioned that specification of you said negative uh, 180 yeah. centigrade, and so that is that's right. a lunar spec. That's not a Martian spec. That's right. That's okay. right. So that this is a, a project called Cold Arm. Uh, it's actually a project with uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and Motive is involved in designing and building this arm. And the the spec that you're referring to is uh, minus 180 degrees C, very cold on the moon, especially over the two-week lunar night. And so we would like to have hardware on the moon of this sort that would not only be able to survive that period of extreme coldness, but also work wow. in that in, in that condition, um, which is not a, 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 an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, there's a, yeah. So there's a marrying of technologies going on here. Um, you've got something um, that JPL has been working on and developing uh, that they refer to as bulk metallic glass. And this okay. is a material that can be formed into manufactured shapes and so on and can survive and work in those types of cold environments. And so they're looking at making motor gears okay. of this material. There's also electronics, things that will work in those environments that Motive has been working on for a long time as well. But that's not um, uh, 
you called it, what did you say, bulk metallic glass. That's a different, those are different materials. It's just. That's right. These, okay. these, these are different hardened, things. Hardened so, circuitry. Okay. That's right. So it's marrying these things together, together effectively gives you a solution where you can actually start to move limbs and, and mechanisms such as robots and robot arms in these environments. That's incredible. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a major feat. In fact, um, uh, Motive recently delivered um, the robotic arm to JPL for some initial uh, testing. It's back at Motive now. Um, but yeah, this is a project that's going forward. It's going to be, it's part of NASA's uh, CLIPS program for refers to commercial lunar payload services. And so a to deliver that robotic arm to the lunar surface in the coming uh, several years or so and actually uh, land in an environment where the lunar night is going to be extremely cold. And it's a technology demonstration uh, mission where we're going to basically demonstrate that this technology can work. So it's, and, um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but mm -hmm. I, I've, I've heard about this from some of my friends that work in the space sector. So the lunar night is two weeks. How cold does it actually get? Because it's one thing to have a specification. Is it mm -hmm. not quite 180 or negative 180 C or is it beyond 180 C and that's just- It can get beyond, it can wow. get beyond. I think that, um, and I don't, I'm not an expert on the sort of uh, entire lunar sort of um, temperature ranges and such, um, but at the location where they would look to land this uh, this lander, that's, that would be the, the spec that we were working Okay, to. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then one of the ways I've heard of for surviving the lunar night and not even necessarily being able to operate in it, but just you know, have your stuff not get destroyed is mm -hmm. having like a nuclear you know, reactor that keeps yeah. the robot hot on the inside, basically. Is, is that the sort of methodology you're using as well? Or is it just able to survive passively without any kind of active heating or some combination of both? Or So not a combination of both, one or the other. Okay. So you mentioned nuclear, that's one approach. Um, a more even uh, pervasive approach is uh, active heating, okay. right? So using the using heaters effectively on motors and their, their critical parts. Yeah. Um, so this technology is trying to not have to do any of that. Wow. Basically no heaters, no heating, um, just technology that operates in that cold uh, regime. Okay, that's wild. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty out there, but it's, um, uh, it's reachable, you know, and, and we're, we're showing that uh, in the technology experiment will ultimately uh, be able to one of the things that proves it. So when you're developing a system like that, is it a lot of iteration and just making it colder and colder and colder inside a freezer and seeing what breaks and then strengthening those those weak points, as it were? Or is it more modeled or like, how do you how do you go about engineering a thing like that? Yeah, so there is definitely a lot of uh, modeling going on throughout. But there's definitely uh, testing is the true deal. Okay. Um, putting these things into so-called ovens, uh, not quite right. ovens in this case though, right? But thermal thermal chambers. Yeah. These are facilities that a lot of organizations have who work in this business domain. And so basically thermal chambers that can, able, that can go down to those temperatures, you basically put them in there and take them down, at, you know, slowly, gradually, and try to see how far you can go for the most part before they actually break or if something else happens, you maybe take that out and troubleshoot that, uh, put it back in there another time and see what happens. So the, effectively, the, this uh, this cold arm, the mechanisms and everything will go through this rigorous uh, testing. Okay, so you run of a battery of tests, you maybe decrement five centigrade or something. I don't know what For example, your yeah. fuel is. And then you run the same battery of tests and then you keep going and going and going until something breaks. And then you do a root cause analysis and try to strengthen that area and then keep going? Basically, yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay, there, really there are cool. different approaches, different approaches that different uh, folks and organizations might use, but that's effectively it. Yeah. You're, um, you, you typically go into the whole thing with some level of confidence, perhaps based on modeling. Um, but sense. then you really, like we were talking about earlier, models are models. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, uh, and so, you know, you really want to do the real testing. And that's what those thermal changes tend to tend to provide. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's always confounding variables, at least in, in my work, as long as I've ever been around. I mean, there's always something you don't take into account in your model. Yeah. And and you know that's kind of what gets you. Also, 
Where do you buy those components for that? Because I don't know that you can buy stuff that gets that cold on DigiKey, to my knowledge. I mean, I feel like the filters don't go that low. Um, eventually, you push the envelope beyond what people are able to manufacture, <laughs> <laughs> right? And Makes they say, sense. well, I need something that can work in, in, in this environment. Um, and in those cases, if it does not come uh, a new project to manufacture such things, if it's possible, um, then there are other ways to uh, go about designing these uh, pieces of hardware such that um, you provide additional protections around those electronic components on a board or what have you. Um, that helps you to deal with whatever the temperature regime uh, That's awesome. is that you have. Yeah. And it, I do have a few friends uh, at NASA. One of them from NASA Ames was telling me that when they build a payload uh, for an experiment on the International Space Station, for instance, which is not as extreme of an environment as what you're describing, mm -hmm. a lot of times they'll... Um, manufacture things in sort of a one-off capacity uh yeah. like by hand soldering or, or working wires or, or doing whatever you need to do to make it at low quantity for that mission because there's just not a business case to justify manufacturing those parts terrestrially so yeah it's it's kind of interesting to hear that uh from your perspective too yeah absolutely that's very much the case and in fact it's, it's i would call it a strong characteristic of the space business uh, especially the space exploration business, right? Because if you think about every, if we just even confine it to robotics, you think about the Mars rovers. Yeah. For the most part, they're all one-offs. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Except for Spirit and Opportunity in 2003, 2004, and, and beyond. Um, those two were effectively twin rovers. Yeah, but that's a two-off. You know, that's, that's a two-off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, that, that's, 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 that's as good as you, you kind of get in this domain. You know? wow. No, the, the, the underlying Wild. thing, though, really, is that uh, what motivates this or drives this uh, to be in this way, this way is that um, typically those missions are taking on some significant uh, problem that no one has really addressed before. Or they've addressed the problem, but not in this domain, this location, you know, this environment. And so everything, not everything, but most things are kind of designed for, right? They're designed for that location, for that mission. Um, there's, a, I guess, an effort of late to try and get a whole lot more reuse, though, out of not only hardware technology, certainly software technology. Uh, and so I think going forward, you might see, and in fact, you're kind of seeing it now. For example, um, again, sticking within robotics, you see the Mars Curiosity rover. Yeah. And then you look at the Mars Perseverance rover. They, for the most part, they look almost exactly the same. Also, so there was certainly a lot of reuse, a lot of uh, redes not redesign, but uh, reuse of designs. Um, and then a, a number of other things were, were different rover to rover. For the first, most part, you know, a lot of leverage was, uh, was had uh, relative to the Curiosity rover uh, on the Perseverance rover. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's the board, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, NRE is very, very expensive. But I guess when you've already got to pay to launch something into orbit and then pay to get it all the way to Mars, mm -hmm. maybe you can afford to sink in crazy engineering resources. Uh, well, they, they we tend to do what we need to on those missions as okay. long as we have the money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes we don't have enough, and we have to get extremely much more clever about how we're going to solve problems. But yeah. This is, again, part of why these missions cost a lot. You know, um, the NRE, the doing things for the first time, the risk involved, and really all of the elements between what gets it from this uh, the surface of this planet to, to elsewhere. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So I guess what are some examples of, of like subcomponents that you've had to create or borrow from other industries in your work just to make these things effectively uh, work? Oh, man, let's see. There's been maybe a number of things uh, that we do on occasion uh, where we can leverage commercial off the shelf uh, items. Yeah. Right. We might integrate them into a system and, you know, sufficiently protect them such that they survive the environment. Um, but uh, so like it happens all the time. A motor, for instance, that you brought up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For example, we, we, we tend to still take advantage of using off the shelf motors for rover wheels robotic arms, and so on. But in some cases, depending on the, the target environment, we need to do some significant things to them. Interesting. You know, and yeah, in some cases, we've, we've gone, done things even as far as uh, 
working with the manufacturer um, to unwind and rewind wind oh, the cool. uh, actual, you know, yeah, all sorts you of things. You change the winding we, material or are you changing the winding characteristics? In, in some cases, in okay. some cases, yeah, it depends on what was called for. Um, but whatever it is that won't allow that that uh, product to Maybe survive, the that's being yeah, used. it's the whole across anything you can probably think of. Yeah. If it, um, yeah, if it helps in the if it's man, if it fits within the manufacturability, yeah. um, fits within the uh, the budget and and, and, and schedule. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. To be real about it, um, the all all these things happen. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I. I... Mm -hmm. The closest analog I have terrestrially, because I, I just haven't worked on any space projects directly in my career. I've been adjacent to a bunch of them in facilities where spacecraft have been being built, but not directly mm -hmm. involved, is I, I worked on a 3D printer a while ago just as kind of a fun project and mm -hmm. was trying to have a 100 degree uh, centigrade build chamber, which is way less extreme than anything motive. Doing, but <laughs> for me, it was, yeah, it, was, it was a challenge that was interesting. And I remember yeah. trying to get stepper motors to survive that uh replacing the bearings with the higher quality bearings and mm -hmm. replacing mm -hmm. the lubricant and, and cleaning them off with solvents to get all the stock lubricant off and then putting lubricant yeah. that's more viscous and you know not going to break down or, or goop off the bearings at those temperatures right. to use a word i just made up <laughs> um, so that, some, some, somehow i understood it <laughs> yeah, thanks <laughs> so yeah i um that's that's and then also putting cooling plates on the back of the motors and, and running okay uh, at, yeah uh, antifreeze through that um with external coolers to bring it down to temperature on the outside of the 3d printer mm -hmm. chassis mm -hmm. um just just stuff like that is kind of as close as i've gotten but it sounds yeah. like you're taking that to the nth degree and you know going down to the you know re-engineering all sorts of components on these missions you know, yeah. just whatever it takes to, you know, whatever to make every yeah. single thing be able to survive environments that aren't even conceivable on the earth. Yeah. Different gravities, but you're, you're, you know, vacuum, no, temperatures exactly. that you would never experience on this planet. I mean, that's you know, right. <laughs> Well, your, your experience, I would say, is is not unlike those of uh, the folks who, who end up doing this within the space domain. I would just say you had different uh, requirements. <laughs> you know, because yeah, you it sounds like the all the examples you gave are are things that you know the typical person would see as pretty extreme, you That's know, um, in terms of modification, right? Yeah, and ripping um, apart a batch of stepper motors, I guess, and modifying them all in the same way is is very similar to what my colleagues from NASA Ames have told me they've done to certain off the shelf mm -hmm. components to put them on a space mission. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I guess that's, that's a big, it's the nature of the game for the most part, you know, Un until and unless there are companies that, um, you know, for, for which it's a, it's a good business case to mass produce these things, you know, that operate and work well in these other environments. And that, that just hasn't really come to pass, even in computing. Yeah. You know, a lot of times people, people, uh, you know, get really surprised by the, um, what seems to be quite outdated and quite slow processes that we tend to use well, that's on because some of these it's got mission legacy a lot of the time right because it's already flown so you know it's going to survive those that's a big part of it that's a big part of it um but additionally uh some of the faster chips if you will um are just not mass produced to the point where anyone who wants to fly something in space is, is just at the ready to buy them all the time right how do you um, mean like um like well, you just can't get a hold of them or can't get a hold of them or they're not being manufactured to your specs. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so, um, you Is know, for example, radiations maybe like an enemy where that would huge enemy. Okay. <laughs> this is Indeed. In fact, radiation is the big bully on the block in that regard. Brutal. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, you know, I go back to way back to the, uh, uh, the Mars Pathfinder mission back in 1997, first Mars Rover from NASA. Uh, it was a relatively shoebox size rover. Um, it ran a 8051 8-bit microprocessor. <laughs> so that's pre-8088. Okay, so that's... Yeah. Yeah. That's, okay, wow. <laughs> right? When did the and mission fly again, just to kind of put it in perspective for me? Did you say when? Yeah. Yeah, 1997. Okay, was when so they, when this, it was this is like mid-80s tech, I think, to my knowledge. The 8085. What is the 8088? 
Yeah. Eight eighty five. Yeah, it was. It was around. I mean, it was being used. Yeah. You know, in a lot of different things, but it wasn't like that was the processor of choice that one would want to you know use in a robot to do all the same things, but not on Mars. <laughs> yeah, <it> makes sense. <laughs> right, and so even that uh, it used an eighty fifty one microprocessor, uh, but again, some things had to be done to it to help it survive the environment and such. Um, but again, there were better processors off the shelf, you know, to, for use in projects down here uh, that could would have been much nicer for the software uh, engineers and everybody else who would have liked to work that mission. <laughs> they can um, imagine recruiting engineers to program that would have been challenging just to find somebody that even knows how to write on one of those. That's right. That's yeah. right. And so, you know, and then the, the same thing happened with uh, the Mars uh uh, exploration rovers were an opportunity. They were running a power PC processor. Oh, interesting. Um, something like 125 uh, megahertz or something like that. Better than you an know, 885. <laughs> yeah, yeah, better than that, but much worse, if you will, speed wise and so on, than what was on our desktops. Yeah, true. And so this, this continues, and really the underlying reason, or at least a big part of it, is uh, that those are the things that are available. And to your point, those are the things that have been proven in on past space missions. Uh, and there's this void in availability of anything uh, like what's in our laptops and so on in our cell phones um, that are hardened enough to be, just be applied to those projects. So what does it take to harden a chip to where it'll survive? I mean, I, I guess you need economies of scale to justify the process economically, mm -hmm. but just in terms of um, the actual engineering process, is it just yeah. thicker walls around the chip? Does it, I mean, I, 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 I'm obviously naive to this. So I'm kind of curious. Right, sure. And I, I'm not an expert in microelectronics. Oh, sorry. Stuff, but, <laughs> but no, but it's okay. But, yeah. but, but I know some of it. And uh, yes, part of it is that uh, even thicker traces, okay. you know, if you look at your garden variety uh, electronics board and you see the thin traces of copper um, on a uh, space hardening board, you'll probably see much thicker. Okay, traces. so it can take like a hit and still not get knocked out entirely. That's the idea, at least. <laughs> okay. You know, some of them, you know, who have been, that have been designed uh, for those certain environments have, you know, uh, suffered radiation hits that, you know, uh, <laughs> weren't quite expected. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, it can still happen. Um, but it's yeah. things along those lines. It's effectively, um, and then doing um, the usual space mission sort of practice of being uh, multi- redundant yeah you know so that's the right? three so variable three path uh multi uh system voting that you hear about yeah okay yeah and so effect and, and certainly you know having dual systems you know say I have, i've got two computers on board one is running all the time but if something happens to it i have a means to switch to the other one nice um you know so there's a lot of different techniques approaches uh, technology is probably advanced well beyond what I had been used to as the various methods for dealing with uh, radiation hardening uh, electronics, but um, that's that's the, the gist of it. Yeah. So you can, I mean, I've heard about even programming techniques go into that. So mm -hmm. I mean, you have yeah. extra variable. Is that because registers can get taken out by radiation strikes? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No, absolutely. It is. Uh, there's something I think people refer to now as uh, software. It might be, so I can't remember if it's software, but software hardening effectively, yeah. uh, where you do, yeah, you apply some some level of computation uh, to clever management of registers and things and other critical components uh, that are somehow- You've always got everything in at least two or three places so that if yeah. one gets destroyed, you don't lose everything. That's right. And, and, and you probably have some means to reroute data uh, to other components, cool. again, par par probably on a redundant side of, uh, of your whole system. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, there's so much magic has been yeah. developed to <laughs> enable space missions. It. It's amazing. And they, I mean, it's a good thing in the sense that, you know, a lot of technology has certainly uh, benefited what we do and work with on a daily basis on yeah. Earth. So. You know, it's uh, we we stretch out there very far and wide to make these things happen, but ultimately a lot of it uh, benefits us here too. Yeah, I agree. Just to nerd out at a low level for a moment again, um, 
you'd mentioned you maybe have two computers and one of them gets switched on. Originally, I was like, well, why wouldn't you just run both of them? So you've got data always back. And I was like, oh, you've got a power budget. So Indeed. Did that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> power, heat, right? Sense. Which can be your enemy yep. as well. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe you're, do you ever use a computer as a heater in the cold environment? Like turn on more compute than you need just to be generating more heat? Or, I mean, I, I would think you'd do yeah. all sorts of weird things. I can't think of uh, specific examples, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was uh, the plan on a given mission. Okay, or a contingency right? plan, maybe. Yeah, or, or even potentially by design. So, for example, if, if, you're, if your configuration Hardware configuration is such that, for example, uh, um, a microcontroller that tends to get really hot uh, happens to be placed nearby a motor that doesn't work well when it's cold. Nice. <laughs> you might take advantage of that. Do you ever you know, have, and your whole your whole thermal model might show you that. Oh, hey, you can actually uh, benefit from this here. That's interesting. I would think maybe like magnetic interference from the motor might be an issue, but maybe. Okay, yeah, so in that specific example. Resilient to that. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. It's okay. like an engineer. <laughs> so. No, that's, that's, this is all really good. I can't fault you for that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> and then also, uh, just because I don't know anything about radiation hardening, is there shielding you can use on more conventional components to make them survive? Or there must be a reason yeah. why people have a different set of chips they go to, even when, yeah. you know, I mean, hypothetically to, to somebody like me that just doesn't know the field. You know, why not just encase everything in lead? I guess it weighs right. a lot. Maybe that has something to do with it. It does, but 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 there there are shielding approaches that okay. um, is, is part part of a craft at that level. Um, at the chip level, the leads that come off the chip, uh, layers in a board, all these things are you know whatever. Again, back to the whole uh, you know whatever it takes. Yeah. <laughs> so you can incorporate shielding into your board, like by adding maybe just another layer of straight copper. Is that how that would work? Or um, it's that sort like of thing plane? has been done. Okay. That sort of thing has been done. You know, in multi-layered boards where you might have um, uh, a copper layer here and another copper layer further up. It might be for heat dissipation purposes. That makes sense. And all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, these are things uh, that are part of the craft that, that people try whenever they need to. Um, or might come up with some new and clever ways that are even more resourceful. That's awesome. I have, I have a friend who is not a space engineer, but a board fabrication house screwed up and sent him um, a board, we'll say, that was intended for a manned orbital craft. And mm. um, he commented that it was very heavy. <laughs> so, ah, fits, indeed. Yeah. Than you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like sixteen layers is the way he described yeah, it. Yeah, chances it's a really are big, heavy, elaborate board uh, from from a certain man spacecraft. <laughs> so. Right, no, it's, chances are that that was that has something to do with it. <laughs> okay, that's that's interesting. This is this yeah. is making a lot of things I've heard make more sense. I, I pl appreciate Good. the time to explain Good. this. Not a problem. Yeah, what are, what are some technologies on Earth? Just to go back to your earlier point, that have arisen yeah. from sort of space developments that you know of. Oh boy, uh, I used to have a, a long list of these in my mind. Yeah, because I I NASA pay sends attention. me those tech transfer emails, and I, I wish I paid paid more attention myself because I'm drawing a blank. I might have thrown you a crappy question there. So. <laughs> well, yeah. So I'll, I'll answer it this way. Okay. Uh, NASA and probably other space agencies. Um, tend to make these things as uh, uh, as make people as aware as possible about these various examples uh, to the point where NASA has a publication they call the NASA spinoff. And this is a publication that one can find online uh, and it will go back through the years and give you many examples of the various okay. things that have spun off from the space program and into our daily lives. That makes sense. And I'm yeah. assuming different materials probably have developed as a result of that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Probably composites, but now I'm speculating because I don't I don't remember either. Yeah, <laughs> what, what, what one will find if they look up those types of publications is that the, the range of things is really broad. I think my memory so phone even, mattress even as is marketed as having NASA technology in it. Yeah, <laughs> for example, yeah. And, and so, you know, even if you speculate uh, chances are you might actually be right <laughs> because there's been so many different things. 
yeah. um, that have uh, been, been spun off from those missions. Well, and even, I guess when you look back, and again, this is more from just a, you know, a part of me that was a kid at one point that was just such a fan of going to the Air and Space Museum and learning this stuff more than some of the stuff I've seen in engineering, but it seems like the amount of stuff we developed when we were, you know, pursuing the Apollo missions and trying to get to the moon, you know, over a very short period of time and, and just the yeah. resources thrown at that problem. I mean, it just a ton of tech was developed in, in an incredibly short window. Right. The point That's where, right. Yeah. There's a lot of a lot of and, and even things that are really kind of still touching us today, like uh, GPS, for example. Oh, it, yeah, because that right? wouldn't work without satellites. Indeed. Indeed. It's a lot, just so much that, you know, that's why I like those spinoff publications because I, you know, always learn something, you know, new about what, what else kind of spun out of these things and these efforts. Uh, cool. But yeah, from the Apollo program on, there's been a lot of different things that uh, we, we're still benefiting from. And it, it will continue because again, otherwise, you know, uh, if there's no one pushing these envelopes, you know, if the, the organizations, the manufacturers and so forth, uh, an industry who don't really have uh, the motivation or the pull uh, demand to do these things. Um, inevitably, if anybody's pushing the envelope, uh, chances are some things are going to bounce back that, you know, industry can use. They're also useful here. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's interesting. So like maybe the incentive didn't exist for industry to develop it on its own, but now that it's there, yeah. we've got a use case for it. No, absolutely. Yeah. And that happens a whole lot more these days. Uh, you know, even even things like look at uh, well, we can't claim necessarily that the latest AI technologies came out of that type of development. Um, there were perhaps a, a handful, relatively speaking, of people pushing for trying to develop such capabilities. Yeah. Um, thank goodness they they, they they succeeded, but now that they have. Look how much how much of the world is taking advantage of it. Oh, for sure. Well, right? I, from like just a robot autonomy perspective, it makes sense given the communication lag that you have when you're communicating with something on the moon or Mars. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. because you, it has to be autonomous, so you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can you can uh, teleoperate to the moon. Well, what's the what's the what's the lag to the moon? Uh, it's uh, it's single digit seconds. Okay, okay, so you could sort of do it. Yeah, you can sort of do it. Well, nothing's the, gonna uh, jump out. <laughs> Gotcha. Well, to, 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 so so back in the early seventies, um, the Russian space program actually did do it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they had a couple of rovers they call Lunacods um, that things. were indeed teleoperated. They they were not autonomous. So just straight up open loop controls. Yep, that's, that's interesting. They, they 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 managed however they could to deal with the seconds of time delay. And um, they managed to do it. They 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 joystick the, those robots uh, quite a number of kilometers. It's <laughs> incredible. Yeah. How did they survive the lunar winter on those? If you know, I'm just kind of curious. Well, I think that, uh, and I can't recall where they landed exactly, but yeah. they uh, probably landed and uh, certainly on the light side and probably near the equator, things like that. Um, okay, I'm not so, so they sure that they. Yeah, and they, and their mission duration, um, you know, might not have. I have to, you, you, you raise an interesting question. I want to find out the answer to that now. Okay. Um, I don't know what the mission duration was, because if it was longer than uh, a couple of weeks, then chances are they had to deal with that. Yeah, uh, and exactly. if I recall, I know that there were kind of hibernation strategies, you know, where you don't do anything. You just kind of sit Wait. and stick it out. Yeah. Yeah. But even that, I mean, batteries are going to probably you know, just conventional battery technology, I would think would get destroyed by those temperatures, even just mm -hmm. sitting there. I mean, there's, there's not many, I guess it depends on the thing, but I, I feel like mm -hmm. a lot of things would just get destroyed just being exposed to those temperatures, even if they're not yeah. operating. That's right. And, and certainly there's a certain amount of, uh, you know, progress you can make on solar energy. That's a good point. Depending on where you are. But again, you know, during that, uh, you know those those dark and terribly cold periods. Uh, either you stand yeah. down, yeah. or yeah, <laughs> you kind of take what the what, what the environment gives you and, and and deal with it if you can. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Those, as if I recall, just from Wikipedia benders I've been on, those mm -hmm. things were about the size of like a Volkswagen or something like a like a small yeah. car. Yeah. Okay. 
that's about right. Yeah, I think they had like something like eight wheels, four on the side. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. Wires uh, made out of wire mesh type uh, uh, material. For, probably for uh, for weight. Uh, or yeah, reasons. yeah. I, I tell you, I bet that they had so many different constraints that were competing against each other to come up with their design. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I can only imagine. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So you can tell the operates to the moon. Um, okay, okay. That's and and then to, with today's technologies that probably have more solutions now for dealing with um, within the control system, dealing with time delay in more clever ways, uh, you can probably do even a better job at it today. What kind of strategies do you have for, for compensating for the time delay with, with control systems? Um, well, some of them are sort of predictive methods, okay. right? Where you say uh, you sort of uh, almost like model predictive control, um, where you effectively predict where your system state is going to be uh, after some seconds later, um, that kind of thing. Um, but then there's also ways to deal with things within a network. Right. And so you um, in effect, you can uh, manipulate parameters in such a way that when you joystick, uh, not that the, the, the signals get held up in any way, um, but there's you can you can massage, if you will, the actual delay that you experience. I'm a little bit confused, but I'm also interested mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm just about to get it. So do you mind maybe giving me yeah. an example? Of so imagine imagine joysticking forward to simply. Okay. Uh, joystick forward. Um, you know that uh, perhaps three, four, seven, whatever it is, seconds later, um, your vehicle's going to move. Okay, that makes sense. Right, uh, and some seconds later, you're going to get some feedback if you do have that feedback coming, um, such that you can then joystick again or continue as you're going. So you move um, incrementally. Um, you can, and in many cases, you're you're forced to. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Because depending on your local environment, um, especially if it's some hazardous terrain, you don't want to gun it. <laughs> yeah, because you might be in a crater by the next time you see it. And you didn't really absolutely. Be there. Yeah. Absolutely. And so so you so you, your joystick forward, um, you can have, for example, on your ground system uh, displays that effectively project you seconds into the future in terms of what you ought to expect. In terms of the system state, even though the system may not have oh, done. Oh, I that. see. I see. Okay, so it's basically a simulation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes. So sense. You, you, that's right. So you use kind of a simulation to, for predictive purposes. Um, we this was even kind of done in the early days of uh, developing satellite um, servicing technology, um, where you could use effectively wireframes of your satellite, uh, largely based on the model that you. You knew you knew how it was built almost like a cad model yeah. uh and effectively overlay that on your display um that was created from real imagery um and allow that wireframe to move the way the spacecraft is likely to move when you when you touch it and things like that yeah a lot, a lot of different approaches and techniques um that people have uh come up with in the past to deal with these these issues really these problems that makes a lot of sense yeah. I can imagine grappling with a satellite is just incredibly hard to predict how it's going to respond, even if you do have CAD of it. Just to... It is. It is, especially depending on if it's uh, powered or not. <laughs> 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 right? And so, yeah, probably the, uh, the way that it's often approached in that sense uh, is you, if you can, um, you want to have it unpowered in the when you're about to, to, to grab it effectively okay. have it floating in, in effect um is that because if and, it's powered it might torque against you and break something or is that for a different reason um basically yes okay. so if it's powered chances are that its attitude uh, control uh and attitude determination system is active and on and it could be commanded to be at a certain pose right uh, for this grappling maneuver or what have you, and then you grapple it, you grip it with your gripper, and you perturb it, and it wants to correct. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> then it's probably fight, fighting against you. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So if yeah. you kill power, you don't have that issue because it's it's passive at that point. You, you're just picking up a That's the That's the idea. 
that's the idea. And you may not have to kill power entirely, entirely as much as you would just, uh, in that case, um, power down or disable the attitude control system. That, that makes right sense. Against you. So yeah, it depends on, on, on what to, you're dealing with. That makes sense. So I, I, it's almost a little bit akin to um, killing actuation on a robot when you're when you're working on it, but not compute, or maybe not. Well, uh, no, no, that's fair. It's a fair analogy. Yeah, I mean, because effectively, what you're really trying to do is is disable the thing that will do what it's supposed to do and move <laughs> the and move it, you know, <laughs> in, in 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 response to uh, disturbances. Yeah, it makes right? sense. Yeah, and so if you just disable that, um, uh, but things are still on, uh, at least you won't have that fighting against you when uh, it does uh, get disturbances. That makes a lot of sense. And I mean, the yeah. satellites that you're grabbing in those cases aren't going to be healthy. Uh, so, I mean, I, I would think that the fault could lend to some unpredictable trait that you maybe don't necessarily know exactly what it is just from the model of what it's supposed to look like if it's you know uh, nominal as they say that's right very possible and actually though uh, at least going forward into the future chances are more and more of those instances where we do satellite servicing um those systems will be you know uh in, a, in good shape and just be uh basically being subject to a repair or replacement uh, refueling, preventative maintenance. What have it sounds you. like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of different things that we believe we can do with the today's technology, as well as technology that that will become will be available soon. Uh, along all of those, those lines, from uh, replacing components, uh, adding fuel, uh, placing new modules onto those oh, devices, cool. where the new modules actually have some power and can do something. Um, uh, to grabbing debris, yeah, and moving it down to a lower orbit to dispense of it, oh, and cool. the, uh, you know, and those sorts of things. That's awesome. A lot of different stuff. Um, so, Motive, for example, and, and and other organizations are working on robotic capability to be able to go up there and manipulate stuff. Um, nice. And so that yeah, that that sort of thing will enable a lot of what I just mentioned. Uh, and some things are certainly more complex than others, you know, in terms of uh, repair, replace, and refuel. Um, but uh, a lot of folks uh, uh, these days are working on technologies and enabling this capability. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Is is running out of fuel uh, like a reason why satellites get decommissioned on a pretty regular basis these days? Uh, yeah, but you effectively want to try to avoid that in the first place if you can. And so the idea would be that um, before they went out of fuel, you know, you sort of uh, cap them off, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but the older, older currently the, done if, if we don't have good satellite grappling technologies. Yeah. Um, well, it's not. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> At least not as in a as a routine thing. Um, there have been experiments. For example, NASA has a a, a project called robotic refueling mission. Yeah. that um, effectively tests out parts of these things. Um, there was a technology experiment um, years ago. Uh, Japan did one and the U.S. did one uh, where they did these on a very experimental basis with dedicated spacecraft. Um, and so we, we know it's possible. It's just not a routine thing that's done today. Um, what Motive is doing and other companies involved in this area, uh, we're trying to make it um, a common thing. And a cool. common capability, yeah. And so part of what we're doing in terms of advancing technology and creating just more and more capable systems is leading in that direction. That's awesome. Yeah. And I would think that would make space exploration and operations a lot more uh, sustainable, too. I mean, if that's the idea. fuel is a bottleneck, I mean, it, it could be as simple as that. Are you, that's right. And, and that is such a great point. Uh, but I, I want to drill deeper because this is such a fascinating conversation. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever come up against issues that you try to service older craft that just aren't designed to be serviced in some of those ways? So, for instance, if refueling wasn't a possibility when a mission was launched, is there, for lack of a better term, like not a gas cap on some of the satellites that you come up against so you can't even access, you know, Mm -hmm. the the fuel supply 
Yeah, so there, there's a, a host of uh, issues to deal with for most of the legacy satellites that are up there. Okay. Uh, most, if not all, uh, have not been designed to be serviced in the first place. Makes so along the, along the lines of what you're basically saying. And so um, so answer is yes. Um, to the direct question of do we or have we dealt with this much, I have to say no because it's just not something we're doing. Right. Yeah, it's not exactly. like we're right. So we don't have a lot of experiences, you know, uh, last time or the time before that kind of thing. Because right? it's a new pursuit. It just hasn't been done a new yet. Pursuit. Yeah. And uh, again, there's been a, a few, you know, a handful of uh, technology experiments on orbit that have done parts of these things. They've demonstrated it. Yeah. But it's just not a common practice yet. Um, but uh, to the question, though, uh, Yes, we, refer, we have various categories we refer to these satellites as being. Uh, some of them are uh, what we call unprepared for servicing. Okay, that um, makes sense. And uh, in the future, folks are getting more and more interested in making new satellites that go up there prepared for okay. servicing. So even right? if the even, technology isn't flushed out yet, you can at least yeah. build in certain grapple points or... Exactly. Like a fuel grapple points... Or, for douchels, for provision systems sense. to, to do a better job at, and that sort of thing. So, but backing up, we're not quite there yet. Uh, how do we deal with it when we have an unprepared and also uncooperative, right? <laughs> there might be, it might be a spacecraft that is, um, or satellite that is uh, unpowered, but tumbling. Okay. And for example, so it's not going to cooperate with you in terms of uh, being still and able, able to be easily grappled and that kind of thing. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, even this goes back to something I mentioned earlier, in fact, when I mentioned uh, the early days of when I got hired at GPL, and this was a focus back then. And we had a laboratory of uh, robotic arms trying to slow down and stop spinning satellites. <laughs> what were some of the methods you attempted to use to do that? And I guess, uh -huh. how would you improve on those now? Yeah, so a lot of that technology back then was um, was teleoperation. Okay. And there were uh, force-reflecting hand controllers, effectively really fancy joysticks. Oh, cool. And you could feel yeah, it. Yeah, that, exactly. And, and these, these satellites, like the Ranger one I mentioned earlier, um, were two-armed. So they had two arms like us. And so therefore on the ground, there were two force reflecting joysticks that one could actually, you know, basically maneuver these things in order to, uh, to do the manipulations. Um, so in terms of techniques, uh, in, in fact, when I arrived at GPL, this was what was going on in the, in the laboratory in terms of testing. Um, what are those techniques? How can you slow down and effectively stop, bring to stop uh, a spinning satellite? Um, so a lot of those things were just being developed. There's not, I can't, couldn't say there's the technique that you'll find in a textbook that says that's how you do it. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just, yeah, you know, the, the practice over the years have come up with a number of different ways to go about that. Um, even of late, uh, today's technology and research, there's some things going on with using things like uh, electroadhesive, uh, you know, grippers and such. Electroadhesive? Electroadhesive, yes. So think of, uh, this is one of the technologies that folks use to emulate things like gecko feet. Okay. Interesting. Familiar? I, I, vaguely, yeah. but not, not from experience, just from hearing about it in publications. Fair enough. But yeah. the, 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 the conceptually, you yeah. know, being able to, to put uh, an appendage on something and it effectively ad adheres to it. Okay, so you apply an electric field and it becomes adhesive? Like, so it's exactly well, what it sounds like. Well, for electroadhesive, yes, because what happens there in that particular technology, there's a number of ways to do kind of gecko like adhesives. But electroadhesive is really, you're looking at um, uh, two parts of the device at very high uh, voltage potential um, and like kilovolts. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, and uh, effectively, there's a reversing of polarity between them such that you create an electrostatic field. Oh, that's awesome. It's like a balloon rubber balloon yeah. on your, your and you stick it to your hair kind of thing. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Uh, so yeah, that's effectively what's being done. And um, it's that electrostatic uh, field that creates an adhesion between two surfaces. And that's strong enough to actually manipulate an object? 
Um, it's strong enough in, in a number of cases to, uh, for example, small robots climbing windows and walls. Okay. Um, but also, same thing, uh, manipulators. I've seen laboratory versions of these where uh, a gecko adhesive pad is affixed to a wall that it adheres to well. Yeah. Uh, and a weight, like a dumbbell, yeah. is suspended from it and holds it up. Oh, cool. So think of that as maybe um, a, a indicative of the, of the sort of forces that could be dealt with. That's pretty neat. Uh, okay, so it almost sounds like as long as you can get a good grip while you're static, then you could probably withstand some dynamic yeah, loading. Not yeah. The, some. Okay, I, I think I have a Yeah, the, the, the grip, the grip is the grasp. key. Yeah. The grip is the key because, uh, in fact, some limitation of the technology is kind of related to the, the surface type. Uh, and certainly the surface, the surface smoothness or disparities yeah. and what have you. So polished um, stainless might be a challenging thing to grab onto, for instance, or Delrin, where you yeah, can't get something like that. Yeah, onto yeah. It. that's right. That's right. And, um, and there are different variations of the technology. And so, um, you know, uh, as some of it has matured, uh, it's been the case that you could have an electrical adhesive surface that is not entirely flat, but is uh, uh, sort of flexible. Okay. I, I like to think of like a um, like the paw of a, uh, of a of a cat or a dog or okay. something like that. You've got yeah. a fleshy part, and you've got the claw yeah. part. Yeah, right? I can picture that. And it's some the fleshy part. You know, some folks have been able to effectively make such surfaces more or less electro uh, adhesive. Cool. And so if you if you attach it to a uh, surface that not, it's not entirely flat, it might be kind of bumpy in various areas, um, that compliance of the surface itself uh, it still gives you a decent um, that makes a uh, lot of sense. foundation. Yeah, you've got some roughness up against whatever you're trying to grasp that you can work with. Yeah, that's do, right. Do the kilovolts that you have to apply to get that uh, adhesion ever create like an ESD concern? Where uh, be, yeah, okay. uh, I, I think most certainly. And so you have to be clever in when you try to integrate these things into real systems. Um, I had been involved in some experiments uh, some years back, just trying it out. And this uh, we had basically yeah. had um, sheets of uh, of uh, material uh, that you could have electronic traces on, like you would have a flexible uh, circuit board. Okay. Cool. Um, and we would have the traces in various different patterns. Um, the idea being that uh, some were better for electro adhesion and some were not. So we were really experimenting. Makes sense. And um, yeah, and so you could, you know, you try all these various things. And again, these are like sheets of material. Um, you apply the uh, electro ad adhesion and, and it sticks. But in order to, you, you can try to slide it off and you get lots of resistance. But when you wanted to detach, all you had to do was kind of peel it off. Instead of sliding, yeah. So in shear, you, you get strong. the force benefit, yeah. Yeah. And uh, until you peel it, so, so it's all sorts of uh, you know nuances like that. Um, but then if you try at least those sheets that we had come up with as prototypes uh, on bumpy surfaces, you could practically forget it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so it became clear that the, the surface, depending on what you really want to be able to adhere to. Um, the surface of your device actually has to have a certain design as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I would almost think you could maybe drive two of those against each other to get additional grip just by exploiting that shear. Or mm -hmm. um, it might impact your, your control strategy for, for the uh, appendage that that's fixed to the end of. For, yeah, I think yeah. so. I think it could be done. Um, you have to worry about a few clever things, but um, I think it's, it's possible. Cool. I don't know that I've seen any implementations that try to do that, but yeah. I'm just thinking about the stuff you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, As no, it's, it's, it's a lot of cool yet. stuff out there. Yeah, that's that's incredible. All right, so we're we're coming up on the uh, the two hour mark here. Um, oh like wow! That's probably a good place. It's going to by I've, pretty quickly. I've been having fun talking to you. I could I could do this for <laughs> two to you know twenty more hours and, and be happy. <laughs> but, <laughs> I hear you. Uh, is just for the interest of, our, of the listeners, though, um, yeah. we probably should wrap it up soon. Is there anything else you want to plug or mention or 
just uh, anything for like young aspiring, you know, robotics engineers or, or people that want to get in the space program? Oh uh, yeah, maybe. What what I'll what I'll, what I'll say is uh, the space domain, you know, is starting to transform to some degree. Um, it's not any longer or in the near term won't, will not be any longer the sole domain of large space agencies in large countries. Uh, the commercial sector is really starting to step up and do a whole lot. Look at a company like SpaceX, for example. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more coming behind SpaceX and not just for doing uh, spacecraft or rocketry that um, effectively provides transportation. But companies like Motor, for example, that are doing robotic systems and robotic solutions. In the past, such company companies existed and we would deliver uh, components and hardware to those larger organizations like a NASA, like a European Space Agency, and so on. And they would integrate them into their systems. Well, now, a lot more commercial companies are starting to do a whole lot more on these missions, and in some cases, flying their own missions eventually. Uh, you've got companies that are looking at trying to have uh, uh, habitats in orbit oh, cool. <laughs> and a lot of things. There's certainly a number of companies that have been looking at uh, doing mineral prospecting on other planetary bodies. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a lot that's go going so on. the weeds in that. <laughs> yeah, and oh yeah, that's a long haul there. Yeah. <laughs> so I say all that just to point out that um, there's going to be a lot more opportunity with students of all science and engineering fields, really, uh, to get involved in these things. Um, and their pathway, their entryway into it will not be restricted as they had been more or less in the past, coming through uh, dedicated space agencies and their, their contractors. Um, so there's a lot more uh, opportunity, I think, coming forth uh, in this field. And so, yeah, if you're interested in space and uh, interested in uh, being involved in systems that explore space or actually go to other planets and do things, um, there's a lot of opportunity. Just look around. Never been a better time to be alive. Uh, Eddie, <laughs> thanks for coming on. <laughs> you're I, quite I, welcome. I really appreciate this. This has been incredible. Um, I'm going to cut it now, but uh, yeah, we should definitely right. do this again at some point. Thank you again. Oh, you're welcome. I had a good time. Appreciate it. Appreciate you.